as I've already told you, we are returning to Exodus 20, and I just want to read um, four verses, uh, verses 8 through 11. And this is um, the fourth commandment. Let me remind you as well that uh, this is the word of the Lord, and so we do need to pay special attention to it and respect and honor our Lord by listening carefully to what he says. This is what our Lord says in Exodus 20, beginning in verse 8. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. By the way, in this last section here where it says that God rested on that day, he's essentially um, talking about heaven because heaven is the rest of God. And that is the rest that the author to the Hebrews reminded us that we need to be diligent to enter. And the way that we enter it, of course, is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But this commandment is meant to remind us that there is a rest, that we are to be striving to enter. And again, the striving comes from not, uh, not the fact that we have to work our way into heaven, but in the fact that if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be wrestling against our sins and we will be seeking to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to become as much like him as we possibly can. But again, we're looking at these commandments now from the perspective that they are the description to us of love. That is what they are. So we want to look at it from this perspective. Now, this particular commandment is a rather full one. And it's very difficult to get everything that, that I might like to say into one sermon. So it is going to be a bit brief. Every part of it is, is likely going to be uh, something important. So try to Stay focused on, on, on the entirety of it as much as possible, and I'll try to make it as, as uh, clear as I possibly can. Now, just by way of review, we've seen so far that in the new covenant, the Lord fixed the problem with the old covenant. The problem with the old covenant was telling us what to do, writing the law on tablets of stone was not enough. It didn't give us the ability to do what the Lord actually called us to do. We needed something more, and in the new covenant, God gave us that something more. He gave us His Spirit to put His law in our minds, His law in our minds, to give us, as it were, a view of the beauty of that law, to help us to see its beauty and its glory. And He gave us His Spirit to write this law upon our hearts to give us the desire to do it. Remember that the commandments are an expression of the righteousness of God. Sin, John tells us in 1 John, is lawlessness. Whenever we break one of these commandments, we're sinning. Well, the whole reason Jesus came into the world was to save us from the guilt of our sins and the power of our sins so we wouldn't sin anymore, which means he came to give us the power actually to do these things. When we walk with the Lord, in the light, then we are basically seeing fulfilled in our lives what Jesus came to do. When he gave us his spirit, his spirit gave us, as we've seen, fullness of light. He showed us what was right. He gave us fullness of love. He gave us the desire for what is right. And he gave us fullness of life. He gave us spiritual life. He raised us from the dead so that we might belief in the only one who did what was right, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might have eternal life. The Spirit of God gave us this fullness so that He might restore us, restore us from that brokenness that the fall brought us into so that He might reorder our lives and give us a new purpose in life to serve the Lord, that we might become His temples. We just sang a little bit ago that the Lord would receive this worship that rises from his temples. It was talking about us. We have become temples of the Lord in trusting Jesus Christ. And as temples, we are to be living examples of how God would have us to live so that we might draw attention to him, so that we might be able to tell others about the gospel 
so that others might come to know him. Now we saw that if the Spirit of God has actually done this work in us, that there are certain things that we will experience. Uh, overall, our brokenness will be fixed. We'll find ourselves becoming what God originally made us. We won't be as we were before. When we didn't know Jesus, when we were spiritually dead, we will become like Him. Now, what does that mean? look like? Well, love is the word that comes to mind. Jesus loved God as he intended us to love, and of course he loved his neighbor as well. Another word is obedience. Jesus obeyed the very definition of love that his Father has given to us in the Ten Commandments. When the Spirit does his work of writing his law on our hearts, of bringing this fullness and this order into our lives, this is what we will experience. We will love God. We will love the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will take Him to be our God, and we will love Him more than anyone or anything else, and we will devote our lives to Him. Our lives revolve around what we love the most. What we love is at the very center of everything we do. If we love Him as we should, we'll no longer look to anyone else or anything else to satisfy us, but we will look to God and we will find our rest, our satisfaction and Him. And everything else that we do will grow out of our love for God. That's what the work of the Spirit of God does within us. And that is the fulfillment of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And of course, what we do with our lives will be what it is He wants us to do and what we promised Him we would do when we joined, as it were, when we were joined to Jesus. We will resist the things that draw us away from God, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and we will serve Him with our whole heart. That basically incorporates the second and the third commandments. Now this morning, let's consider something else that we will experience if the Spirit has made us new creatures, and that is that we will want to spend His day with Him. Now, we all know that when you're in love, you want to spend as much time as you can with the one that you love. If we love God, especially if we love Him in the way that we are called to love Him and the way the Spirit of God gives us the ability to love Him, we will want to spend as much time with Him as we can. Now, the problem is that life is busy. It's very busy. Busy with work, busy with family, busy with friendships, busy with responsibilities, that it's difficult to find the time that we would like to have with the Lord. Well, the Lord knows that, and He's actually solved that problem for us, at least partially, by giving to us a day that we can all spend with Him, and that is uh, the Lord's day. Now, what I'd like us to do is consider three things about the fourth commandment. First one is how the Lord calls us to love Him on this day. Secondly, why He still wants us to spend this day with Him in the new covenant, that is why we believe this, this uh, uh, day continues. And what this day tells us about ourselves and about how much we love or do not love the Lord. It's kind of like a spiritual thermometer. So first of all, how does the Lord call us to love Him on this day? Well, this, this is the easy part. He tells us in verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. First of all, the Lord wants us to remember this day. With all we have to be concerned about in the busyness of our schedules and everything that we have coming against us spiritually, we can often lose sight of what is most important in our lives, and that is spending time with the Lord. He doesn't want us to forget Him, and so He calls us to remember His day. 
Now, secondly, he wants us to remember this day, to keep this day holy, which means he wants us to set it aside for him. The idea of holiness in the Bible always has the idea of set apartness. We are holy to the Lord, which means we are set apart from the world and set apart to him. In the Old Testament, there were certain objects which the Lord said were, were holy, uh, certain incense, mixtures of incense that were holy to him, which means they were to be set apart for his use only. And by the way, as I mentioned before, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are holy, which means that you are to set your lives apart for him and his use and his glory alone. Well, we apply this to the day. And he says, remember to keep this day holy. And what he means by that is he wants us to set it aside so that we might spend it with him. Now, he's not talking about just part of the day. He doesn't say, remember the Sabbath to set aside part of it as holy, but remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. The Sabbath is a day. He wants the whole day set apart, at least that part when we're awake. Now, third, he wants us to rest on this day. That is what the word Sabbath actually means. He wants us to rest from the things that we would do on the other six days so that we may spend his day with him. Now, this means that we aren't to do work. And because he wants everybody to have this day off to spend with him, he doesn't want us to be the cause of others having to work as well. And that's what he tells us in verses 9 and 10. He says, <clears throat> six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. So we are to work on the other six days, but we are to get all of our work done in those six days so that we can set this day aside to spend with him. Now again, our Lord Jesus Christ declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath, and there were certain things that he had to point out to the Pharisees regarding their misunderstanding. They had actually taken this commandment and they had put so many rules and regulations around it that a person could break it if he walked too far, a person could break it if he you know, did, did too much in their estimation on that particular day. But our Lord Jesus did tell us that there are exceptions to this. If there is work that has to be done on this day to prevent the loss of life or property, such as that work done by police or firemen or doctors and nurses, or if there's work that we have to do to take care of our needs, such as preparing meals or taking care of our personal hygiene. I would I'd venture to say that none of us likely came to church without somehow fixing ourselves up and making ourselves look our best. We do that because it's a sign of respect to other people. Uh, if there are things that we have to do that are consistent with this day, such as worshiping the Lord. Now, we may not look at this as work, but it is actual work to worship. It's work to pray. It's work to sing. It requires effort. It's work to preach. As a matter of fact, it's exhausting work, you know, to do some of these things. Sometimes we can find ourselves getting a bit tired. But this is what the Lord calls us to do on this day. So this is acceptable work. Or if there's anything that needs to be done to um, support the worship, uh, such as what's going on up in the balcony or the people who are serving by playing the piano or greeting or ushering, uh, or to support the fellowship, uh, the fellowship of God's people. When we're done here, um, you know, a little bit later, we're going to share a meal together. There's going to be work done as far as getting the food warmed up. There's been work that's gone into it and preparing it. There's going to be work in cleaning it up. There's going to be work in setting up and taking down. So that supports the fellowship. That is work but that's acceptable work. Or if mercy dictates that we serve someone. If we see somebody who needs help. Jesus said, you know, when he saw a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, he, he healed that man. And when they accused him of breaking the Sabbath, he said, which one of you, if you had one of your farm animals, like a donkey, fall into a ditch, how many of you would not lift that donkey out of the ditch 
on the Sabbath. And then he says, how much more worth is a man than a donkey? It's acceptable to do acts of mercy on the Lord's day. And particularly if you see somebody who is lost and dead in their sins and you have the opportunity to share the gospel with them, if it is something that, that necessity dictates or mercy dictates, then we may do it. So our Lord tells us to remember his day, to set it apart so that we might spend it with him. Let's not forget that is the reason we do this, that we might spend it with him. He doesn't want us then to do unnecessary things that we don't have to do on this day. He doesn't want us to cause others to do work that isn't necessary. He also doesn't want us to involve ourselves with the things that will take us away from what he wants us to do on this day, which is to spend time with him by doing things that are recreational or play that isn't recreative, that draws us into the world. That's what Isaiah 58 was about this morning. Remember, turning our foot from doing our own pleasure on his holy day and call the day of the Lord a delight and honor it. He wants us to set aside all of these things so that we might rest and worship him together and spend time with him. Now, I've already suggested to you that what the Lord has actually given to us in the fourth commandment is a picture. It's a foretaste of heaven. When we have finished what the Lord has put us into the world to do, we will enter into our rest. We will enter into heaven where we are going to rest from our work. And I hope you understand that heaven is not a place where they play football, basketball, baseball, fishing, sports. Some people think that heaven is kind of where everything you enjoyed in this world, you're going to be able to do there. I've, I've heard that at a number of funerals that typically take place in churches that don't have a very good understanding of Scripture. But these are the things that we are going to leave behind. We're going to rest from work. We're going to rest from these things that we used to think were even entertaining. And we're going to do there what we're doing here, which is worshiping Him forever. Now these Sabbaths that the Lord gives to us, one day in seven, every single Lord's Day, are like so many promises that the Lord holds out to us every single week, pointing us to that rest that is ahead of us, pointing us to heaven, to remind us that no matter how long we live here, it's only a moment in eternity. It's like a vapor, James says, that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. I mean, look at how quickly time goes by. Look at how quickly those that used to be young grow old and then they die of old age. Life is very short. This day reminds us that life is short. But it reminds us that if we've trusted in the Lord Jesus, that this is not our final resting place. Heaven is where we're headed. We're only passing through. These days, these Sabbaths, these days of rest are also like so many spiritual oases to refresh us as we wander through the barrenness, the dryness, the spiritual wilderness of this world. And it is dry until we arrive in that place of complete spiritual refreshment in heaven. Now the Lord knows that his people have always needed these days, which is why he established them from the very beginning. That's what he reminds us of in verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. When did God establish the Sabbath? He did it on the seventh day the very first week of the creation. It was the day that he rested and blessed, and he didn't do it for himself. He did it for us. And he didn't mean it to be some, sign of, some kind of a, a burden to us, but he meant it to be a blessing to us, and that's the way we need to see it. Remember, Jesus said in Mark 2.27, the Sabbath was made for man. And not man for the Sabbath. He didn't create the Sabbath and then create man so that man would have to do something he wouldn't want to do on the Sabbath just so God could have his Sabbath. God made the Sabbath for man to be a blessing to his soul and a day in which we can all 
meet with him and spend time with him. And that's good because we love him. And along those lines, even if God had not given us this commandment, we would still want there to be a commandment just like this. And the reason is because we love him. And if we love him, we want to spend time with him. We would want this kind of a day because we need to be reminded over and over again where we're headed. You know, the distractions of this world are continually drawing us away and burying, as it were, the knowledge of God. It can have that tendency. I think you all understand what I'm talking about. And we would also desire this day because we need the spiritual refreshment that the Lord is pleased to give us on this day. So even if there, there were no commandment, this is something we would still want to do because we love the Lord. Now, it's no wonder with, with what this day means, what the Lord intends it to be and the blessing that it is to us and the refreshments and so forth that the Lord gives, it's no wonder that the enemy of our souls will do everything that he can to try and keep us from spending this day with him. We need this day. We're going to see a little bit more about that in a moment. We need a day like this to be recharged and to be refreshed. And without it, we grow spiritually weak. The enemy knows that, and so he's going to try to take us away. Now, this brings us to our second point. Why God still wants us to spend this day with him in the new covenant. Now, one of the devil's most effective lies that keeps many, if not most, of God's people from doing what he actually calls us to do in this commandment is the idea that the Lord no longer wants us to do this, that we no longer need to keep this day in the new covenant. Now, all the devil has to do is convince us that this is the case, and then our flesh and the world will do the rest. They'll take us away from him and from the blessing, the spiritual blessing that God intends for this day to bring us. So the question is, why should we believe that this is still what the Lord wants us to do? Well, the simple and most direct answer, and one that I've been actually building towards as we've been going through this particular series, is because this commandment is included in those commandments, that law that the Spirit of God has put in our minds and written on our hearts in the new covenant. We saw that when we started this particular series. Remember, the old covenant people of God did not continue in God's ways. Well, what ways were those? In his covenant. Well, the ways that God revealed in his covenant on the two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. This is the problem that the Lord says he was going to fix in the new covenant by giving us his Holy Spirit to put these laws in our minds and write them on our hearts so that we would want to keep them. But again, what law is that? It's the law written on stone, which are the ten words or the ten commandments. That's the simplest way to get to this. But another simple argument is this, that in the new covenant, we still need this day. We still need rest. We still need to spend time with God. We still need a day that is off in common with one another so that we can worship him together and fellowship with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Those needs have not changed. We need this day so that we can do what the Lord intends to do and intends to give us on this day. As a matter of fact, the author to the Hebrews tells us that this is the case in Hebrews 10.25 where he tells us not to forsake our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now remember, they didn't have the freedom of schedule that we have today. They didn't have like an eight-hour work week and a five-day work week. They worked from sunup to sundown. They worked six days a week. The only day that they could possibly have off together would be the Lord's day and only because the Lord calls them to do this. But Paul, or I should say the author to the Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling together. Why would the Lord do away with something he established from the very beginning specifically to meet these particular needs when these needs still exist? 
Now, if this isn't enough, the Lord has already shown us directly that His Sabbath continues. Remember what He said to the author to the Hebrews, that there is still a Sabbath for us because of the work that Jesus has done in Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 11. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. I've already told you the phrase Sabbath rest is the translation of a word in the original language that means literally the keeping of a day of rest, which is what the Sabbath is. The reason this day continues is because Jesus, by, entering, by completing his work and entering into this rest, has opened a door of rest for us in heaven. He did this on the first day of the week when the work of the new creation was complete. That is why the Sabbath rest continues, the, the day of the keeping of the rest, because it's foreshadowing the rest that we can eventually enter into and we do enter into in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's exactly why the early church met on the first day of the week, is because they were celebrating what Jesus did on this day when he completed his work and he rose from the dead. And this is also why in the New Testament, the first day of the week is called the Lord's Day. John writes in Revelation 1, verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And the interesting thing is that word there that's translated Lord's is, is an adjective that's only used in two contexts. It refers to the day that belongs to Jesus and it refers to the supper that belongs to Jesus. The Lord's Supper and the Lord's Day, those are the only two things that are modified by that word in Scripture, and it means they belong to Jesus. So on the first day of the week, the day Jesus rose from the dead, John was in the Spirit, and God gave him this vision. We've already seen in the Old Testament in our call to worship that the day that Jesus rose from the dead was going to be a day when his people would gather together and rejoice. Psalm 118, verses 22 through 24. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Which is what we're doing today as we meet together on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Now knowing that this commandment would still be in force after he died and rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven, Jesus told his disciples to pray in light of that coming judgment on Jerusalem that they wouldn't have to quickly get out of Judea either in the winter or on the Sabbath. We don't often think about this, but Jesus was telling us in this passage that the Sabbath was still going to be observed even after he died and rose again. He says in Matthew 24, verses 15 through 20, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. Now, whatever your view may be of when these events we've just read about were actually to take place, whether it was in 70 AD or still future from our perspective, it's clear that it's after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And yet the Sabbath was still continuing and the disciples would still be observing it. Jesus says to them, you pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. By the way, Jesus was addressing these things to them because he knew they would live to experience them. 
So don't let the enemy convince you that you no longer need to keep this day holy. God still wants to spend the day with you. Not because he needs it, but because you need it. He means it to be a blessing to you. Now finally, I told you there were three points. The third point is this. How can this day serve as a spiritual barometer or thermometer, an indicator of our spiritual health or our love for the Lord? Well, we've already considered that even if the Lord had not given us a commandment like this, we would still want there to be a day just like this. We would want to spend time with Him because we love Him. And I think we all understand if our love for the Lord is as it should be, we would really want to be able to do this every single day. In other words, we wouldn't say, drat, I have to spend this day with the Lord. We would be saying instead, I get to spend this day with the Lord and I wish every day was like this day so I could set aside all these other things of the world that I have to concern myself with on the other six days and I could spend it with Him. You realize that one day, if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, every single day is going to be just like this day when we're finally with Him in heaven. Now, think about this for a minute. Ask yourself this question. Do you want to go to heaven? Is that what you want? And if you say yes to that question, if you do want to go to heaven, why do you want to go to heaven? Is it because of what heaven is like? Is it because there you're going to be able to rest from your work? Because there you can set aside the recreations which we'll all admit oftentimes we enjoy a bit too much and we spend a bit too much time doing so that you can finally devote yourself to worship the Lord in the way that your heart wants you to worship Him. Well, that, that's what heaven is. You see, that's what heaven is like. Now, here's how you can measure your spiritual health. This is what the Lord calls you to do in spending one day in seven with Him on His holy day. If you enjoy this, if you enjoy this day, if you delight in this day the way that uh, the Lord said through Isaiah 58, then you'll know that you will enjoy it when you're there. But if you don't enjoy that, if you don't enjoy worshiping the Lord, if you don't enjoy spending a day with the Lord here, then can you really believe that you're going to enjoy it there? See, some people make a heaven of their, sort of like their own conception. As I told you before, I get to play my favorite sport. I'm always going to win. I'm always going to get the touchdown. I'm always going to get the field goal. Everything's going to go my way. This is what heaven is like. Whatever I enjoy doing, I get to do it there, and I get to be a winner all the time and so forth. Well, anybody can make a place of their own conceiving that they want to go to and, and desire to be there. The question is, do you want to be in the heaven that really exists? Well, this is a picture of that. Do you enjoy this? You have to enjoy this if you're going to enjoy that. If you don't enjoy this, then you're really not going to enjoy that. Now, we all have to admit that we all struggle to some degree on this day. Even the most committed have some struggle. After all, the devil is continually using the world to tempt our flesh into wanting to do things other than what are good for us, other than what God wants for us. But we also know if we really love the Lord, this is what we really want to do. And we're grieved over that part of us that doesn't want to do it. We will want to worship the Lord not only on this day and spend it with Him, but we'll want to do it with the entirety of our lives. And we will look forward to heaven, to the time when we can do this for the rest of eternity. Can you honestly say that that is what you want? That's what you want to do. Well, if you can, then you do love Him. If you can, then you really are experiencing the work of the Spirit of God bringing fullness and purpose into your lives. He has written His law on your hearts. 
Now, if you, if you honestly don't want to do this, you don't want to spend the day with him, you don't want to devote yourself to him even for a day, you do need to ask yourself the question, why don't you want to do this? Because even if this commandment, as I've said, wasn't in force in the new covenant, if your heart was right with him, this should be something you would want to do. As a matter of fact, you'd want to spend all your time with him. Well, the answer can only be one of two things. Either you've fallen into a spiritually dull state or you don't know him. Now, if you have become spiritually dull, let me suggest this. Begin to spend this time with the Lord again. Use this day as the Lord intends for you to use it. Read the Bible You can't be spiritually strong unless you read the Bible, meditate on it, apply it. Seek the Lord in prayer on this day. Spend time with the Lord. Gather with His people for worship and fellowship. You know, we have two services on the Lord's Day, and we do that because we believe it's important. It's a blessing. It's meant to build us up in Christ. Seek the Lord on this day and seek Him every day until he brings his fire back into your hearts. And let me tell you, if you know the Lord and you're spiritually dull and you do these things, he will do that. You will be on fire for the Lord. But if you don't know him, let me suggest this. Use the day, this day, use every day, to seek the Lord until you find him until you can turn away from your sins, until you can look to Jesus in faith and trust Him and by His grace receive His life and have that law written on your heart so that you begin to love the Lord and do what He calls you to do. Well, may the Lord help us to see again that this day is not an anchor the Lord has tied around our necks as it were to drag us down. That's the way a lot of people seem to view it. But it's a day that the Lord means as a blessing to refresh us, to give us a day where we can spend with Him. May the Lord give us the grace then to do that, to spend the day with Him, to love Him more, and to let this day really set the pattern for the rest of the days in the week, which is to love Him and walk with Him and serve Him every day and in everything that we do. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to, um, to help us see the day as He intends it to be and to use it as He would have us to use it.